I'm giving the first lecture of the day, which really introduces these ideas of innovation and sustainability. Um, it starts off with a few uh, definitions, or at least exploring these terms and the different ways that they're used, the different meanings of innovation and sustainability. And then goes on to look in a bit more detail at what we call the 3D agenda. Um, the particular way that the STEP Centre tries to understand innovation and its role in sustainability. Uh, drawing from a particular project that I convened from 2008 through till 2010, which is one of the uh, aspects that Ian mentioned yesterday, which kind of brings the STEP Centre's work together. This project was called Innovation, Sustainability, Development, A New Manifesto, and was an in international project where we identified these uh, three Ds of direction, distribution, and diversity, which I will introduce in a bit more detail. Now, that project draws on quite a lot of history, and not only of STI and sustainable development debates, but also the history of SPRU and IDS, the two sister institutions that make up the STEP Centre. And so in order to introduce the manifesto project, I also need to give you some background of some of the work that was carried out within those two institutions and which inspired us to undertake the manifesto project uh, in fr starting from 2008. So definitions. Now, Ian spoke yesterday afternoon about pathways to sustainability. So I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about sustainability. Um, as hopefully it was clear, the way that the STEP Centre sees sustainability is as an essentially contested term. What's most important is uh, the framings that different actors adopt. So we ask questions such as, within any given system, providing system functions, what needs to be sustained, by whom, and for whom? Um, I won't rehearse those again, because Ian talked about that uh, yesterday, but I will talk a bit about innovation, and the different ways in which innovation is seen from an innovation studies perspective, and also seen in a broader way by the, the work of the STEP Center. I heard somebody say yesterday they don't know anything about innovation, um, and I'm going to start from the basics, as it were, but I'm going to use as an entry point the economics of innovation, and an economist that SPRU colleagues draw on quite regularly, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, and the distinction that he made between invention and innovation. So, many people think that innovation is about new ideas. Now, we would say that actually invention is about new ideas. Invention would be um, a sketch, a model for a new improved device, product, pro process or system, but it only becomes an innovation on the point that it's actually used. So drawing from Freeman and Serta, who themselves drew on Schumpeter, uh, an invention only becomes an innovation on the point when it needs, leads to a commercial transaction and the invention is actually exploited to lead to economic change. Now, we're not economists in the Step Centre. We don't think that economic change is necessarily the most important uh, impact of innovation. We're interested in social change. We're interested in the ways in which uh, human societies interact with the environment. But still, it's worth thinking about innovation as the point in which, at which a new idea is actually implemented and, uh, and used. And again, looking at Schumpeter, he said that innovation is possible without anything we should identify as invention. And invention does not necessarily induce innovation, but produces itself no economically relevant effect at all. And so the relevant issue to draw from this is that it's not necessarily about brand new ideas. We're not necessarily just drawing on new science. Uh, innovation itself is very often and Schumpeter himself also talked about this, the result of novel recombinations of existing knowledge, existing ideas, in ways that have not been done before. And we'll come back to that uh, when we explore these different uh, 
types of innovation. So some of you are innovation studies scholars, and for some of you this will be pretty familiar. But when uh, economists and innovation studies, science and technology policy researchers look at innovations, they often divide them into different forms, different categories of innovations. The most commonly known one, the one that was dis uh, discussed earliest on in the history of innovation studies, is product innovation. And so most people might think of a hybrid car, a high-tech product drawing on uh, relatively new scientific knowledge, but again, recom recombining it in novel ways. But as well as these high-tech innovations, we're also interested in innovations that draw on other forms of knowledge. So another example might be a Zeopot. This is a technology that has long, a long history in um, Middle Eastern cultures, which uses passive cooling as a way of keeping uh, food products fresh. You don't need electricity, you don't need external energy. It works on the basis of evaporation to keep um, products fresh for longer. You might say this isn't new and so it's not innovation, but there are initiatives that are drawing on these traditional technologies and actually improving them. For example, the National Innovation Foundation in India, <coughs> which may come up in discussions later, are, is drawing on these kinds of technologies, recombining them, improving on them so that they are innovations. But innovations of a different kind to these high-tech product innovations. Secondly, we've got process innovations. And again, you might think of high-tech industrial processes. For example, using a new kind of enzyme which leads to lower wastes for the chemical engineers who are in the room. But beyond that, there are other processes. For example, how you design market gardens for um, community-level food security and diverse livelihoods. So some examples from Brazil and Latin America that have pioneered new processes for <coughs> developing uh, agriculture at, at local scales. So products, processes, and more recently in discussions of innovation, uh, people have started to think about organisational innovations. So here, if you draw from the Oslo manual or the work of the OECD that tries to categorise and characterise innovation from an economic point of view, you might be talking about new management techniques, uh, just-in-time or total quality management, these kinds of organisational innovations. But we are also interested in community level, social organisation and new models for, in this case, again from Latin America, designing and building water collection devices at the level of communities and villages. So innovation is not just technological, it's also organisational. And we try to bring all of these components, all of these kinds of innovation into our work and into the 3D agenda. Now, again, recombination is vitally important and you often get mixtures of technical, social change, organisational innovation combining together. <coughs> and some scholars have, been, have talked about these things combining to lead to much more uh, wide-scale, broad-scale changes, which they would describe as system innovation. And we may hear Johann Scott talk about this when he outlines ideas of socio-technical transitions. But it's mainly historians of technology who've provided us with these kinds of insights. Many of you will be aware of the transitions literature, which has drawn on historical case studies to investigate how technical change, various different kinds of technical change, has actually interacted with social changes in terms of uh, cultural change, regulations, changes in the market, changes in different actors within uh, economic systems, for example, to shift what they term the socio-technical regime. So one very well-known example was written about by Frank Hales, who introduced something called the multi-level perspective on socio-technical transitions. And in 2002, he looked at uh, this shift from sail ships to steamships. 
published that in research policy, and that has that paper has led on to a lot of discussion about precisely how these technical changes and organisational changes interact over time to lead to broad macro systemic transitions. What the STEP Centre works on primarily is contemporary transitions, the kinds of transitions or pathways to sustainability that are unfolding at the current time. And it's an ongoing debate whether these kinds of transitions literatures can actually be applied usefully in discussions about uh, pathways to sustainability going forward. While it's recognised they're pretty useful in understanding historic historical change. So, how can we think of systemic uh, system innovations that are unfolding at the current time? Well, let's take, for example, mobility systems. Let's take organisational changes exemplified by car clubs, for example. Organisational uh, models that allow different members of a community to share infrastructure, to share cars in more efficient and environmentally sensitive ways, which came not out of new technologies, but really about communities getting together and establishing these car sharing clubs. Those are being combined with new technologies, software, to enable these kinds of systems to work a lot more effectively. I'm a member of a car club. I use it, well, I wouldn't say on a weekly basis, but very regularly. It's fantastic. I've got a car at the end of my road. I book it. I use it. No, no problem. But going forward, we've got other technical innovations which are coming on stream. Self-driving vehicles. What does the transitions literature say about a combination of car clubs, car sharing, self-driving vehicles, what kind of transition that will lead to. Uh, not only people being able to walk to the end of their road and use a shared vehicle, but hit their mobile phone, have the vehicle drive to their front door and take them wherever they need to go. It's an ongoing discussion about how useful these frameworks are. Um, the, fr the STEPS Centre hasn't looked at this particular question, but if we did, what we'd be looking at really is <coughs> which kind of actors are shaping these possibilities, which kind of actors are framing the notion of sustainability and how this combination of social and te technological changes can contribute to more sustainable forms of mobility and as a result of some of the more dominant actors pushing particular directions of change, which other alternatives, whether that is public transport, whether that is um, cycling, or whether that is different approaches to urban planning, are being neglected and obstructed as a result. I won't go into any further detail on that, but it's just to introduce the kinds of ways that the Step Centre and the Pathways approach would engage with these kinds of um, innovations and changes. What I am going to do is to um, move towards the 3D agenda, and in particular, um, these ideas of directions, which I hope were implicit in Ian's talk yesterday <coughs> and uh, your understanding of the, the pathways approach. The distribution of benefits, costs and risks from innovation, and the importance of the di diversity of different kinds of innovations, which hopefully I've illustrated in this, um, these introductory slides. And here, I start to talk about the project, Innovation, Sustainability, Development, a New Manifesto. And in order to do that, or before doing that, I think it's worth um, providing some background about why we embarked on this project. It's not that usual for an academic group to write a manifesto. Uh, having just emerged from a general election in the UK, uh, manifestos play a particular role and most academics don't actually spend their time writing these things. But we had some historical inspiration that led us to do so. And first I'm going to introduce that. It was some work that was carried out by colleagues fr from the sister institutions, SPRU and IDS, shortly after both of the institutions were established in 1966. Um, at that point, 
thinking around science and technology and development was uh, relatively new, especially, and in fact, thinking about international development was relatively new. IDS um, was, uh, you know, a forerunner in a lot of that thinking. But in 1969, the United Nations actually approached a group from Sussex, from IDS and Sprue, and said, we are about to enter the third development decade. Um, we would like to commission you to write the introductory chapter to the World Plan of Action on Science and Technology for Development in this decade. Um, and this group of people, Hans Singer, <coughs> Jeff Oldham, Charles Cooper, Chris Freeman, various um, pioneers in these areas of development studies and science and technology policy, worked together to produce this introductory chapter. Now, what happened next is what earned the text, earned the document, the name, the Sussex Manifesto. Basically, these guys put forward an analysis of the state of science and technology in development, uh, a critical analysis, and put forward some pretty radical recommendations for the time. The United Nations Secretariat, in response, basically said, yeah, we've decided we don't like this anymore. Um, in fact, when Jeff Oldham and Chris Freeman flew out to Ethiopia to present this, they were greeted by uh, someone from the UN that said, it's okay, you can go back on the, get on the plane and go home again. But our colleagues insisted upon publishing the document and in fact were delighted that the UN might sue the University of Sussex um, as a result because of the extra publicity that they thought that this would attract to the document. Um, as a result, it was published, but as an annex to this report, and it earned itself the name of the Sussex Manifesto. That provided us with some inspiration 40 years later to write a new manifesto, again looking at science, technology and innovation, addressing some, of the, some, of, some similar issues that had been addressed around poverty alleviation, around inequality at a global level, by the original manifesto, but also looking at environmental sustainability, and hence the name Innovation, Sustainability, Development, a new manifesto. Now, this is also important in terms of providing a historical counterpoint to our new 3D agenda, because if you look at some of the recommendations and analyses of the original Sussex manifesto, they largely focused on differences in the amount of investment in science and technology in what they called the advanced economies and the developing countries. And a lot of their recommendations were precisely on this basis, very much of this form, about increasing the amount of investment in research and development sp spending and in associated scientific and technological services, things like um, metrology, museums, education, uh, intellectual property institutions, these kinds of things. So this is just one of the recommendations which focused on a particular indicator that is central to a lot of work in science and technology policy, the proportion of gross national product, as it was termed then, that is dedicated to investment in research and development. Now, to be fair to our colleagues, they also, as well as saying more needs to be spent, they also talked about institutional changes that would ensure that this expenditure was actually used for, not just for new ideas, but for innovation. It actually made an impact, it was implemented, it led to social change. But, despite their um, attention to this qualitative as well as these quantitative um, recommendations and targets, most of the debate subsequently has very much focused on getting more investment into research and development and especially in um, uh, science, technology and development um, discussions around the world. It's a very different world that we live in now but a lot of the attention still remains in this idea of more. More investment, faster techni technical change, a greater rate of innovation. 
And it's against this counterpoint that we, uh, we um, embarked upon this new manifesto and the 3D agenda. In order to do that, though, we tried to learn the lessons of history. We tried to look back over the 40 years between the original manifesto and 2008, as it was at the time, and we tried to gather ideas not just locally, but from our partners around the world. So one of the tools we used to do this was a wiki timeline where we invited um, people here, students, also collaborators uh, across different um, regions to contribute entries to this timeline that marked out what they saw as being the most important studies, but also meetings and decisions about innovation, sustainability and development. We also ran a dedicated seminar series, we commissioned 13 background papers, we had our STEP Symposium in 2009, which brought an international group together to discuss a draft manifesto that we had written. And I think one of the most interesting and informative components of the project was running nearly tw well, 20 uh, round tables across the world, hosted by our partners, including some of the partners that Ian mentioned when he discussed the Global Consortium yesterday, where we invited them to think about innovation, sustainability and development from their own national and institutional perspectives and the kinds of policies but also um, different forms of social change that could contribute to these kinds of shared goals. And what was most interesting about this, as we expected, was that these ideas of development and sustainability were so situated in geographical institutional settings, disciplinary settings as well. Um, and the multimedia that emerged from these processes goes to serves to um, confirm those different framings of sustainability and different understandings of innovation and how it can contribute to those kinds of goals. Now, we were, you know, we were really informed and inspired by all of these kinds of uh, inputs, all of this feedback. We had some very constructive and some very critical feedback to the draft manifesto that we'd circulated, which was fantastic. We weren't able to take all of it on board. We didn't try and put forward a representative consensus of what the world thinks about innovation, sustainability and development. But we did go on and, drawing on some of those lessons, publish the new manifesto. And um, the new manifesto itself tried to escape this notion that innovation was all about high tech, all about research, formal scientific knowledge, and it tried to adopt a very open and inclusive notion of what innovation is. So, rather than seeing innovation as, you know, the, this, this only possible for Google, only possible for the most um, innovative countries, Switzerland, I believe, is one of the most innovative countries now, we see innovation as new ways of doing things, which basically means anyone is able to innovate. Anyone is capable of innovating. Beyond that, we also put forward a vision for innovation. That science, technology and innovation work far more directly for social justice, poverty alleviation and the environment. And this, we said, requires a new politics of innovation, globally, nationally and locally. And this politics, we argued, should be shaped around what we call the 3D agenda. Rather than thinking about more investment, more innovation, faster technical change, far more attention needs to be given to the directions in which innovation trajectories emerge. The directions of pathways at a system level towards specific sustainability objectives. Not just this broad notion of sustainability, but sustainability of what, for whom much more attention needs to be given to the more equitable distribution of the costs, benefits and risks associated with these forms of innovation and recognising that these objectives of sustainability and development differ so much around the world, any idea that particular forms of innovation, um, unitary forms of innovation, single forms of innovation can serve 
these multiple framings of, in, of sustainability and development, recognising that we need a diversity in forms of innovation and in socio-technical systems for a number of different reasons, which I will come on to when I talk about the third D, diversity. So, um, one of the ways that we try and um, explain this 3D agenda is by using this diagram, which uh, illustrates how much of the debate around innovation is framed. Innovation is often seen as only being possible in one particular direction, only one form of uh, technology is ever possible, and in a lot of political debates, for example in this country, the emphasis is on faster. The emphasis is on this being a race to advance technology um, without any kind of idea that it can advance in different um, directions. So just some quotes to illustrate that. Our Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, the government strategy is pro-innovation. And in the, at European levels, alongside the Lisbon strategy, we see similar kinds of uh, statements. Pro-innovation, not about what kind of innovation. The Royal Academy of Engineering, history is a race to advance technology. Countries are racing down this motorway, this um, one-track race. George Osborne, we go on equipping Britain to succeed in the global race by investing in science, amongst other things. So there's very, very little thought given to innovation of what kind, for whom, for what purposes. When you combine these, or you compare these, to insights that come from um, the economics of innovation or sociology of, of technology, history of technology, it becomes apparent how short-sighted and how oversimplified they are. Now, economics of innovation often looks at uh, markets, factor prices, impacting on the directions of innovation, moving towards optimal configurations, um, that are induced by these different, these changing prices, for example. Sociology of technology, and many of you will know of the social construction of technology framework put forward by people like Viva Baker, has looked at how uh, demands across society, needs across society, actually shape technologies as they emerge. So in one of his examples, he starts with a whole range of different designs of the bicycle, sees that some of those were used by, I don't know, young men looking for action sports, riding penny farthings as fast as they could, um, trying to avoid uh, dangerous injury. Others were designed for children. Others as uh, social changes emerged, started to be designed not only with men, but with women in mind. And um, Baker gives a fantastic history of how society constructs the technology of the bicycle to give us this stabilised form of the bicycle, the safety bicycle. So there are insights from the socio sociology of technology which blow out of the water this idea that there's just one single track path. But again, we're not interested in history at the step centre, we're interested in how technologies are going to emerge going forward and in the directions of innovation uh, from here on in. So we kind of look at this in a, in a different way. Obviously, what we're starting with here from this diagram is the idea that there's one technology, one form of innovation which can emerge in various different directions across time, so time going um, upwards on the screen. Um, and so here, we are broadening out, we're opening up the discussion about potential forms of innovation for democratic um, debate. And this is where this, you know, um, this focus on direction in the 3D agenda comes about. But again, looking at the history of technology, we also appreciate that this isn't a case of any particular direction is possible. 
We are constrained by history. We are constrained not only by the technologies that are available, but also by social um, context and by various forms of what we call path dependence or lock-in. Now, some of you will be familiar with this literature that describes how particular trajectories of change, technical change specifically, um, are subject to this notion of path dependence or lock-in or momentum. Various different scholars have called it different um, things, but just some examples. If you're old enough to remember these two formats of uh, video cassettes, Betamax and VHS, I'm just about old enough. Uh, there, was a, there was a real battle about which of those would become the global standard. In the end, despite the fact that Betamax was better on some particular measures of performance, VHS became the glo global standard. And we have similar kinds of um, episodes in uh, f battles over technology standards around much more contemporary technologies. Take another technological artefact, the QWERTY keyboard, which some of you are tapping away at now. Now, that had its genesis 100 years ago uh, with the invention of the typewriter. And this particular configuration of keys was put forward because it led to the hammers in the typewriter actually getting locked together less often because the letters that were most often used in close proximity when people were writing were actually placed further apart on the typewriter. As a result, people started to learn how to type. Many of you can touch type. You type very well on a QWERTY keyboard. But as a result of that, the next 100 years is a history of not being able to break out of that uh, path dependence of that particular configuration of a technology. So here you see the technology interaction with society, with the skills, with the practices, something that was mentioned yesterday again, um, and contributing to a particular locked-in trajectory. Now, if we look at the systemic level, the, sy the system scale, that's also evident. These forms of lock-in are evident as well. So, urban transport, once you start, once uh, conurbations or, or um, urban settlements start to be planned with the private automobile in mind, they become much more dispersed. People start um, using their private automobiles. You know, um, some of the, the cities in, on the uh, west coast of the US are great examples of this. Um, the different functional parts, residential, industrial, of, of the city, are very, very far apart. Um, and whilst it works with private automobiles, switching across to public transport is made much more difficult as a result of this pathway that has um, emerged, including social and techno technological um, components and infrastructures as well. Centralised energy is another example. You Focus on large thermal or nuclear power stations and design your grid around that where there is centralised generation distributed out to users in industry and in uh, residential users. It's much more difficult to then shift to a distributed uh, energy system where renewables, solar, wind, micro generation actually feed into a much more um, widespread a decentralised approach. So you get these lock-in effects, not just at the level of technologies, but at the level of systems. And a lot of the debates, the most controversial debates about technologies that we see, for example, in our own country, are not about just the risks of particular technologies or the interests of particular technologies. They are battles over the pathways that are going to be taken from now and into the future and um, actually locked in as a result of these various different social processes that the sociology and history of technology tells us um, are actually quite widespread. So discussions about GM agriculture or organic agriculture are often framed in terms of the risks to human health or the environment. 
but actually they are about the interactions between the technology, intellectual property, regulations, who's controlling the technology, all of these issues, which again are taking, on, taking us on particular directions of technical change, but wider pathways of social, technological and environmental change. And there are similar um, debates in power, urban planning, as I've mentioned before, and also pharmaceuticals, which I know some of you are working on, pharmaceuticals and healthcare. So, it's these debates around direction which we need to pay, pay a lot more attention to, um, we argued in the manifesto. <clears throat> and in addition, we, as hopefully was evident from um, Ian's talk yesterday, the role of power in actually shaping these directions um, is also often overlooked or Im implicit. So we have, for example, something that Lila Mehta mentioned yesterday, this Tina narrative, there is no alternative. Powerful actors in advocating particular technological um, directions saying there is no alternative, we must turn to nuclear, we must turn to large dams, for example. All of these power dynamics play a really important role in shaping the directions and often leads to closure on particular pathways, the closing down of pathways. This often reflects incumbent interests and excludes uh, more marginalised communities, more marginalised framings of sustainability and development. As a result, the negative impacts of technology and innovation often bear most acutely on the least powerful groups, not only immediately, but also in the longer term. And so, it's this discussion about the distribution of costs, benefits and risks from these different pathways, from these different directions, that is the second D of the uh, manifesto's 3D agenda. Now, um, when we talked about these kinds of issues with our um, partners around the world, it was evident that development, sustainability was anything but, you know, a, a shared... Um, simplistic um, notion. Taking into account these different framings, situated knowledges, perspectives, interests, uh, it's impossible not only to identify one form of sustainability and sustainable development, but also the idea that any particular form of innovation, any particular direction of innovation, on its own, can actually contribute to or address all of these different framings of sustainability and development. And based on this and a number of other uh, reasons, the third D that we turn to in the 3D um, agenda is that of diversity. Recognising that it's not just a question about which kinds of innovations, which, which pathways, but also looking at multiple pathways, plural pathways, different kinds of innovations, drawing on different kinds of knowledge, addressing local and specific uh, challenges, um, as well as thinking about um, innovation um, more generally. So, this idea of diversity, which is quite, quite novel, draws a lot on Andy Sterling's work, um, is, I think, one of the contributions that the manifesto and other work within STEPS has made to um, debates about science, technology and innovation um, for development and for sustainability. What's the importance of diversity? Why do we need diversity? Well, for a number of different reasons. Firstly, pursuing a diversity of approaches can actually help us to, uh, to avoid and mitigate against these processes of, of lock-in. Rather than embarking on particular trajectories which may be favoured by powerful groups, which occlude or make it much more difficult for more, um, more bottom-up grassroots approaches to actually succeed. Um, actually fostering a diversity can help us to avoid these processes of lock-in, of path dependence. In addition to that, innovation studies have shown that maintaining variety across an innovation system actually leads to continuous innovation um, of different kinds. 
having more diversity within innovation means that you've got much more um, opportunity to actually recombine these different kinds of knowledge, technical and otherwise, in novel ways. You have skills available which can be brought to bear on particular challenges, and as a result, um, innovation actually uh, benefits not just from economies of scale, but from economies of scope. Diverse skills, diverse knowledges, diverse um, institutions. In addition to that, um, the, the pathways approach, as um, Ian talked about yesterday, um, pays a lot of attention to the limits, um, the limitations of our uh, levels of knowledge, and especially around different kinds of incertitude, um, uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, risk, but also ignorance. Inst instances where, because of the rapid changes, in interacting social, technological systems, environmental systems at a global scale, we're really ignorant about some of the challenges that our systems are going to have to respond to. So we need to pay attention to durability, robustness, resilience, all of the things that uh, were discussed yesterday. But fostering a diversity of innovation approaches actually helps us to hedge against that ignorance. We don't know what shocks or stresses around the, are around the corner, but we can be pretty sure that we're better able to respond to them if there are multiple ways of doing things, whether that is energy, whether it's food production, um, existent in our systems, rather than just um, much more rigid, um, unitary, top-down um, managerial approaches that are sometimes less able to respond in a dynamic way to these kinds of shocks and stresses. So that's another importance of the third D, diversity. But in addition, diversity, rather than just responding to sustainability uh, in terms of <clears throat> you know, low carbon, for example, you know, carbon emissions is an important aspect of sustainability, but it's only one aspect. What was evident from our round tables and what the Pathways approach is all about is that sustainability means a whole range of things to um, different actors within systems. And diversity actually enables us to accommodate this plurality of values and interests and priorities. So those are the, um, the reasons behind the third D, diversity within the 3D agenda. But just to illustrate how the STEP Centre has used this and taken it forward, um, we worked with colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Centre and the TELUS Institute to apply this 3D agenda um, and think about direction, distribution and diversity in the run-up to the Rio Plus 20 summit and contributed this piece, Transforming Innovation to Sustainability, um, to the debates, um, something that which we've drawn upon in our engagement subsequently past Rio Plus 20 in the run-up to um, the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll be talking about next uh, on, on Thursday, Thursday afternoon. And so this 3D agenda, people have found it quite useful in the UK um, and at international levels, thinking about how Sustainable Development Goals need to respond, they need to be universal, but at the same time they need to respond to different sustainability challenges at national levels and at sub-national levels. So, uh, an attention to the directions, distributions, and diverse forms of innovation and change um, has played a role in those debates and continues to play a role in the ways that we engage with the SDGs, which we will talk about further on Thursday. Thanks very much.